Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Frank Dickin, Associate Professor of New Testament here at Lincoln Christian University, and I'm here today with our Strauss Lecturer for 2020, Dr. Dennis Edwards, mm -hmm. who is Associate Professor of New Testament at North Park Seminary in Chicago, yeah. and our campus pastor, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Brian Lowry. Mm -hmm. Today, we're here to talk about uh, Dennis's new book, Might from the Margins, which has just been released last month with mm -hmm. Herald Press and is available uh, through all booksellers. And uh, having read the book, I, I highly recommend, uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested in issues of justice and how the gospel speaks to that, that you get a copy uh, and interact with that and think deeply about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, uh, Dennis, for yeah. being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I really am uh, excited to be here and grateful for the opportunity. Thanks. We, we appreciate it very much. Uh, to begin, I would just like to ask you, mm -hmm. if you could, for a few minutes, tell us what was the impetus for this book sure. and, and what led you to write it? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Part of it was I had done some work in the uh, book of First Peter in the New Testament, as you know, and, uh, and found there was a message there of people who had been pushed to the side in the, in the Roman Empire, yet they were the ones who could demonstrate to the rest of the world what it means to follow Christ. It, I mean, we get our like apologetics verse from there in 315 about being able to, to, to t talk to others or respond to others with meekness and, and uh, fear of God to be able to say why we have this hope. So one was that, First Peter. The other was my years of pastoral experience that I had been in churches that strove to be um, multicultural or multi-ethnic, and, and I had uh, friends who wanted that in their churches as well. But we struggled a lot because even though you could get people together in the same room, you still wound up having uh, challenges, I'll just say it that way. And uh, so I, I realized there was a power dynamic at play that we didn't always acknowledge. And uh, so, so that notion of dealing with power as well as marginalization I saw in First Peter. And then also I wanted to rally people who had been pushed to the side. So I guess the third thing was trying to bring some solidarity to people who have been on the margins, yeah. In, in this morning's lecture, you uh, spoke a little bit about the concept of diaspora people, mm -hmm. diaspora people, mm -hmm. and you took that language from First Peter chapter one, right. uh, and that seems to be much of the basis, uh, mm -hmm. the starting point for this discussion in this yes. book. Yes. Uh, could you just briefly again sure. mm -hmm. uh, recapture that idea of how yes. a diaspora person lives and exists today? Right. The, the notion of being uh, away from your homeland, that's diaspora. That's it, you know, basically in a nutshell. But, but diaspora people have been displaced. So it's, it's a word that sociologists use and anthropologists use to talk about people pushed away from their homelands, like Africans who are spread around the Caribbean and, you know, United States and such. But the main point is that people who have been displaced are vulnerable, they suffer, they are alienated, and that is the image I wanted to take from First Peter and use that image to describe uh, Christians who are been pushed to the sides in our society. Yeah. Thanks for that. I, I often tell students when I'm teaching First <coughs> Peter that I, I don't mm -hmm. think there's a New, a New Testament book that speaks mm -hmm. more directly to the American church mm -hmm. than First Peter. Yeah. Uh, but you're even drilling down a little more. Uh, deeply on that yeah. and, and looking at marginalized people, which Christians were right, in the first right. century. That's right. Right. I think Christians in general have been, were marginalized in the first century, like you said. And I do think also, I agree with you, it speaks to the American church because the society as a whole does not understand necessarily the ways of Christ. But yeah, I do drill down a little bit more because I think folks who have been um, uh, marginalized for a variety of reasons, so, you know, race, class, culture, ethnicity, sex, gender, have been pushed to the side, and then even within Peter's group, there's women who are addressed particularly, there's slaves who are addressed particularly. So even in that community, <clears throat> excuse me, there are those who are in the margins of the margin, you know, so, yeah. Very good. Uh, after our lecture this morning, we solicited a few questions uh, from uh, people mm -hmm. that were there, and Brian Great. has a couple of those. I'm going to sure. turn it over to him for a minute. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I want to start with one that speaks directly to a journey we've been on mm. in campus here. Uh, we, in this fall semester, have been making our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Um, so Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and right before mm. the lecture unfolded, is unfolding mm. today, yeah. uh, we'd spent quite a bit of time in Matthew 5. Wow. And I'm, I'm just going to read directly the question that sure. was sent in. Mm -hmm. um, don't know who <laughs> sent it in, but it, clearly someone mm. who's been on that journey with us yeah. in the fall. But they write, I, I saw a quote earlier in the semester around August that said, stop using sermons of peace and forgiveness in order to manipulate the oppressed into accepting their oppression. Mm -hmm. And they write, this quote really resonated with some frustration I was experiencing with my own home church and resonated mm -hmm. with the views of the people of color that I was following and reading from. Yeah. But then I returned to campus and was hearing sermons of peace and unity. And while I understand there's a place for sermons on peace and forgiveness and unity, mm -hmm. In the white evangelical Western church, those messages are more often than not preached from a place of complacency. Could you speak to the balance huh. of peace and forgiveness while combating complacency in light of some of the issues you address in Might from the Margins? Yeah, wow, it's a great question, and I, and I will try. I think, and maybe it'll get at some interpretive issues too, because some people approach the Sermon on the Mount differently, but I think of the Beatitudes, for example, as not postures that you um, have to adopt, but, but addressing the people who are in those places. So if it says, you know, blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for justice, then it's not saying, how do I all of a sudden create a hunger and thirst for justice? Like there are people who are already hungering and thirsting for justice, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Jesus is saying they're blessed because they will be satisfied, right? So I think there's something that those messages are affirming uh, and uplifting folks who are poor in spirit and hurt and down. But at the same time, they're speaking to the folks who, have, who are in the place of power and privilege so that they don't abuse it. Um, so, you know, I, I was on a panel discussion once with Stanley Hauerwas, who um, has written a lot and kind of comes from that place and tradition that would adopt a lot of teachings of the Sermon on the Mount and see them, you know, at work in our society now, right? And, he's, and I asked him uh, something about this, and he said, well, I don't, he said, I don't ask of people in a marginal position to lower themselves. And, I, and it made me think about it a lot, um, that in many ways he's saying that you, you're not, um, that the message to the folks on the margins, in, in other words, the challenge to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry about that, for peace and justice or peace and reconciliation is often for the people in power to learn what does it mean to lay it aside or to use it differently. So I don't, it's not meant to be a sledgehammer for those who are already down at the bottom. And I, and I do that in concert with Philippians 2 because I look at what Jesus did in laying aside privilege as God and to serve humanity. So <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is I agree with this, this person who asked the question that messages about peace and forgiveness are really supposed to be the most salient challenge to the people in power. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, this was something uh, leading up to your time mm -hmm. with us that Frank and I were talking about. Um, I really appreciated the chapter you have in the book that speaks to a prophetic voice, mm. a prophetic spirit, a prophetic ministry. Yeah. It's kind of related to this question. There's, there's this balance of, and I, I don't mean to say they're pitted against each other, but being prophetic, but being pastoral, mm. making a stand and turning the tables on injustice and also doing it tenderly, but still pointedly. Just, hmm. if you could talk a little bit to how we find a balance between taking hmm. a stand, but also doing it in a shepherding way, in a, in yeah. a tender way, but still direct. Well, I'll, I'll try, <laughs> because, <laughs> because part of my, my challenge, I mean, this is a dentist challenge, something for me, having been a pastor for a long time, is wondering do I do, how well do I do that? Because if I'm pointed on something and passionate about something, you, you know, you risk alienating some people, right? And if you are uh, giving a lot of shepherding kind of care and maybe gentler about certain things, like I'm trying to fish for the right word because I want to always be gentle, a fruit of the spirit. But, 
but I do want to be clear about things, you might alienate some others. I think there's always going to be some level of alienation. And I think one of the things for young preachers that, or pastors to learn early on is you're not going to please everybody, right? So I guess I don't know if it's a balance I'm looking for. I mean, I thought it was when I was a younger pastor. Now I really think there's a certain, there, there are issues, maybe not issues, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sense from, of aff affirming God's people and God's creation that I'm passionate about that I think has to be communicated strongly. And if it rubs some people the wrong way, I think what I'm comfortable now saying is, what, can they ask questions about what's going on inside of them as to why this is a problem, why this bothers them? So, so I, I don't want to put the power into the listener to say, well, they're being pastoral so I can listen, or they're being too prophetic so I'm not going to listen. I don't, I don't want to give them that power. I want to say it's my duty before God to speak the truth, to speak it forthrightly, hopefully speak it, you know, gently and honestly. But then each listener has to reckon with what's going on inside of them. And if things aren't not right with you and God, then you might not hear it well. If they're going well with you and God, you might say, oh, I understand what they're getting at. Some of that applies to me. Some of it doesn't. But I see what they're, what they're getting at. So I, I think the ball's in the court of the listener. You know. mm -hmm. uh, to, to follow up on that a little mm -hmm. bit, Dennis, um, uh, we're dealing mostly with mm -hmm. uh, young people, college students and seminary mm -hmm. students here who in many ways in my experience mm -hmm. want to have yeah. a prophetic voice yeah. uh, in the church Amen. and in the culture. Uh, yeah. Along those lines, how would you encourage them uh, yeah. to, to capture that power mm. Right. In a spirit of gentleness. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, too, because I think what I try to say in the book is that, that pr prophets aren't, um, we see them in moments, right? We see them in their oracles. We see them, but, but their lives are given over to this. You know, I mean, just, just read Ezekiel. I mean, this poor guy's life <laughs> is given over to all these object lessons for people and tough situations. So I don't take this prophetic thing lightly as your soapbox to rant on something. I, t I think of it as a way of life that embodies God's truth so you can speak it forthrightly. <clears throat> so when people want to make change in society or they want to address change in society, I want, I want to see a whole picture of who they are, not just what they tweet or not just what they can rant about. So for young people who want to change the world, I, I'm saying, yes, amen. But please be whole people, you know, in doing this. You, your walk with God matters in this. Your relationships with people around you matter. So, so I want to see the prophet as a whole person and not just the message. You know. that's, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. in, in this chapter on prophetic ministry mm -hmm. um, in the book, you uh, mentioned that what, what is oftentimes mistaken for prophecy is just pointing and complaining, and I think you touched on that here uh, in, in your last answer. Could you say a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah, and, I, and I've seen it in everybody's, you know, the spectrum of uh, political viewpoints, because I have friends all over the place, and, and, uh, and especially on social media. And, and I mean, I know it's easy to pick on social media, but it's something we're familiar with, I think. And so it's easy to kind of complain and, and target, and, you know, now we talk about canceling people, cancel culture, all of that. I think it's easy just to see something and you see a piece of it and you just go after it and just say how horrible this is. Or another piece of something and just rave about how wonderful it is. And, and, and there's just something that's, that lacks depth to that. And I don't think the Lord wants that. I think when, even when Jesus is denouncing, you know, the Pharisees and Matthew and he's got woe to you, woe to you, this is not just he decided one day to, to fuss at some people. There's, there's like a whole history here. There's a whole way of being that Jesus is denouncing, and, and he has the authority to do it, not just because he's Jesus, but because it doesn't measure up to what they knew to be right. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm not particularly interested in people who just tear down or denounce or say negative things about somebody. I want to see how they are engaging uh, the world and those around them. That has more integrity to it as far as I'm concerned. So when you denounce something, it's because it's coming from a place where you are seeing the big, bigger picture of what's happening. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. 
I, uh, to kind of build off of that, Frank yeah. and I both had pointed out to one another in the mm-hmm. book that moment in the chapter yeah. on um, a, a prophetic spirit, a prophetic voice that you had pointed out. It's not just merely <clears throat> pointing <throat> um, out injustice, but also pointing the way of God. Yeah. And you also use a, a term there in saying it's not just complaining. Right. <laughs> um, and yet at the same time, in, uh, in a later chapter, I, I think it's in the chapter on okay. worship, you talk about the power of lament, mm-hmm. um, which is not the same as complaining, no, but right. it's it's anguish, it's That's an right. ache. I think That's you right. use that aching terminology. Yeah. There is a place for that, and it's it's a lost form of worship. And many people have pointed that out. Yeah. And yet, I don't even know if it's fair to say it's a lost form of worship because you even draw from streams of history where lament has had a much more powerful place in our worship. Right, right. Um, just talk with us a bit about huh. how maybe we need to reshape our corporate and even personal worship to create space for lament yeah. and allow the witness of that. <clears throat> you know, that, oh, thank you for catching that. I. My friend, my colleague, Sung Chen Ra at North Park has written that whole book on prophetic lament, and I would strongly recommend it. Because there's something powerful about having you and your people or whatever situation you're in acknowledging that something wasn't right here and we want to pour out our hearts before God. So when, you, so when you're looking at like Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept as we remembered Zion. This is, there's something there's the anguish that's in that, but there's also a recognition that, um, you know, we lacked harmony with God. We got into this situation. We want to repent. We want to renew. We want to restore. But we got we to gotta take toll of how messed up things are, right? You know, and we're, and we're weeping by the river here. I think that sometimes I don't, I don't know that people who have experienced the more, uh, the, the <laughs> I don't know how to say it, but in the more powerful and privileged places in our society, if they really understand lament like people have been hurt do, because to say I'm sorry for something is not just, is not the same as wailing and, and, and aching in solidarity with, you know, folks who experience that pain firsthand. So I would say yes to what you're asking in essence. <laughs> yes, I would love to see us restore a sense of what does it mean to acknowledge wrong, to sit with it for a while, to do like in the Old Testament where people are repenting in sackcloth and ashes and really saying, Lord, this is, we, we, we want to hear from you. We want to be restored. We want to be renewed. Things have got to be different. I, I don't think we, I don't, generally speaking, I don't see that that much in Christianity. So I think that's what you're asking. I, I just find that people who are doing well are less likely to lament. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the bottom line, I guess. You, you had mentioned um, a book that looks at lament. Are there other resources, um, folks who have been navigating this well when it comes to worship and worship structures? Oh, no, I haven't, actually. I mean, I guess I, I wish I did know more. I I mean, I think the examples I use in the book are older ones because I think of the the rich tradition in the African-American church of spirituals, you know, that were born out of pain and, and I mean, they were fundamentally work songs, but they were songs that were reflecting on their place in the biblical story, right, and seeing themselves in the biblical story. So so some spirituals have a real tone of lament to them. Um, I'm not asking white people to sing black people's songs, but I am saying that there's something about paying attention to that rich tradition that could, you know, feed you in some way. Um, but no, I don't, I can't think of liturgical resources off, but I, I thought more of that, like what Soon Chan writes in, uh, he uses Lamentations to, the book of Lamentations to guide uh, us. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the spirituals because that's a theme that shows up also in a, mm-hmm. the powerful chapter you have in there about hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in many ways, I think I'm, I'm glad you raised it because Thank I think you. we can learn from the journey right. that they go on in the spirituals that have been right. passed along. So right. I appreciate Thank you. That. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this notion of hope, I, what I was hoping, <laughs> what I was trying to do to talk about hope, I'm going to use my, the word in my answer, which you teach kids not to do in, in junior high school. But, um, but the, the notion is that sometimes we could, when we're seeing the injustice of the world, think that the that, the, that the, the goal is to get a policy to change or to get somehow a political thing to happen. That may be a small piece of it, right? But, if, but real hope is in, 
in God and is in the future and a, res a restoration of all things in the Lord. So I want my hope to be there, right? So if I put all my hope in the here, then it's easy to get frustrated if my candidate's not elected. It's easy to get frustrated if a certain policy doesn't get enacted. But if my hope is there, then I can see more clearly. Now, of course, I, I want injustice to stop now. I want people's uh, safety to be affirmed and such. But I, but I have to see that as only a foretaste of what really God has in store for humanity. Yeah. <clears throat> thank, thank you for mm -hmm. that. I, I, while we're on the topic of worship, mm -hmm. in the book, uh, you mention how our worship, and I, I think you mean our corporate worship, yeah. affirms the status quo hmm. of power, hmm. uh, and particularly power structures. And, and even in your lecture this morning, you mentioned power mm -hmm. in the church, and that oftentimes uh, is a negative concept mm -hmm. in the church. Uh, but you, you spin it positively, and this is a big question. I, I'm wondering if you can help us think a little bit uh, about how we can worship together in ways that doesn't yeah. just yeah. promote the status quo. Yeah, I, it's something I think about from my pastoral years, and, and I I'm not sure I have like the definitive answer, but what we, what we try to do in church is actually, and people kind of mocked me or gently for it and maybe teased me is a better word, in that I was willing to uh, give away a lot of my own uh, leadership authority to affirm people to take on more. And I remember as I was leaving the church even and, and building a plan for transition, one of the leaders in the church said, well, you lead with open hands. And I really like that image that she said that um, because she knew I wasn't trying to hang on to stuff myself. So I think what I'm getting at is sometimes the way churches operate is that there's leadership or power is invested in a small group of people. Um, and, and often those people are, we can almost describe what they would look like. And I'm saying what is more helpful is if we can find ways to to see others um, participate in ways where, where power is less centralized, right? So that, in different churches, that's going to be different things. For me, it was having more um, group conversations in the church. So rather than some annual meeting where the leaders already made decisions and we're asking the congregation to affirm them, which happens a lot in churches, we started having more quarterly conversations and, and um, where I wanted to hear what the congregation was feeling. And I even said, I want, I want my finger on the pulse of things. I want to know what's happening as, as the senior pastor. But I also want each other to know what's going on, what we're thinking about, what we're feeling, so that by the time we get to annual meeting, there's less anxiety, right? There's, there's a sense that we know where, what's happening. So that's power in a sense, right? It's a power to say, this is my community. I have a say here. Um, so I'm just asking for creative ways that people can do that. Um, so it's not just the service, right, when I say worship. It's not just the Sunday morning service. But even that, too, can have a way of saying it's more of a corporate event here than the few people up front um, uh, entertaining or uh, directing. Um, and that takes some energy and creativity, I would say. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. If, if we can move it even a little bit outside mm -hmm. of church life yeah. and corporate church life, um, we have a lot of students in our business program mm. here who right. are business majors. Oh, great. Uh, and just this is a pretty open-ended question, but would love to hear from you a little bit about what it looks like um, might from the margins in the marketplace. <laughs> Uh, ways because the marketplace <clears throat> and the work that they'll be doing is ministry and it's kingdom yeah. representation. Wow. What does it yeah. look like for the Christian in the marketplace hmm. to create space for those who've been marginalized, give them yeah. a seat at the table and power? Wow. Well, well, you're saying it, having the seats at the table and sharing power. I, I, um, you know, when I, it's funny, when I, I worked as a teacher in an independent school, um, two different occasions in New York. And that's only because I didn't have an education degree, I had an engineering degree, but I wound up teaching math and science. And I would have to say, in those environments, I was much more, my, my voice was, they, they eagerly wanted to hear from me. Um, I'm an African-American teacher. They wanted more uh, black students at the school. So I was invited uh, eagerly by, um, <laughs> by 
the uh, headmaster and others in power to be part of discussions and thinking things through. And now, now I left and, moved and went to D.C. before some of the things got enacted. But I, I remember just consciously even saying to some people, it's funny that in Christian circles, there was a lot of time when Dennis could say something, that, and if Dennis didn't say what everybody wanted to hear, then we don't need to hear from Dennis anymore, right? And uh, so my voice was marginalized that way. And I thought, man, in the secular environment, they kept wanting to hear what Dennis had to say to, to make things change. And here in the Christian environment, there was less, it seemed like there was more at stake for them changing than it was in, in my school. So I guess what I'm saying is in the marketplace, I sometimes find the market is much more driven with pragmatics. So they want diversity because they know in the long run that's going to help. So for people in power, they often, I, I don't know, often I don't have numbers, but I have seen a willingness to engage in some level because they know in the long run that's going to be better. It's actually church people, I think, that, that are slower at times to embrace these things. But, I mean, that's just my own uh, anecdotal evidence. So I would hope in the marketplace people would see that there's value. It's always, I mean, this is proven that there's value in diversity of voices and opinions. And the more folks you can get, uh, diverse people you get to help make decisions, the better the whole organization will be. So I'm hoping that your business students will find themselves in places where they can share in a diversity of viewpoints when they're making policy decisions. Yeah. <clears throat> if I can play off of mm -hmm. when you talked about the movement that you made uh, from being in the school and then to DC, mm -hmm. uh, with great fear and trembling, <laughs> we'll move into politics a oh. little bit here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You mention uh, later in the book yeah. uh, a moment from Dr. King's preaching, a sermon that he preached a knock at midnight. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and talk about the, the, the church's tenuous relationship in, in a world of power and in government. And Dr. King says in that sermon that the church should not allow the state to be its master or not allow itself to be its servant or tool, um, but rather the conscience of the mm -hmm. state. Right. Um, a lot of different people landed on a lot of different sides on this, sure, but it sure. could be pretty gamely argued that the church has fallen into some pitfalls when yeah, it comes to this. I think so. Um, how do we avoid giving up our role as a conscious of the state to try and be its servant or its master? And uh, what does it look like for us to mm -hmm. be the conscience of yeah, the state? Yeah. Wow. Um, I really think that is a powerful image there, and I'm not, I'll make my disclaimer that I'm not an ethicist or political theorist, but what I've noticed and what I believe even from my scripture study is that there's a place, even in, even in the United States, and we're actually freer to do this, is to stand apart from the, the governmental power structures so that we can critique it better or we can uh, inform it better. I think that there is, I would prefer to see that in the church. But I think it does require for us to live as healthy community ourselves. So when we're healthy, then we have something um, uh, better to offer to the, to the state or even to be critical of the state. But when we try to get our power from the state, then it gets harder to criticize it. Because cause if we criticize it, then we might get cut off in some way. So I think the weird part now is on the right and the left, there's a sense of, we need to get our candidates in place, and this is Christian saying that, so we can get our voices to be heard. And I think, man, if we could work better on who we are as people of God, then we don't need the state to bless our voice, right? We, we will have a voice that we can now give to the state and say where the state is right or wrong on things, or just better, because I think I'm not expecting the state to be quote-unquote Christian, but I do expect it to operate uh, within a realm of justice that um, the church can give its voice to. So I say that, like I said, there's a lot of other people, experts at politics. I just think if we could work on being better, healthy community ourselves, and I feel like what prevents us from doing that is, is our political biases. We have this allegiance to the state that sometimes supersedes our allegiance to each other. And that's, that's what frightens me actually right now. I think what you said there gets at the, the vision of the New Testament where the church stands apart from the state. I, amen. To, to go uh, to, to First Peter, their diaspora people, 
they don't have a constitution or rights right. in that society. Exactly. I, I think of Acts myself. They proclaimed another king Amen. other than Caesar. Amen. Uh, what is your advice to yeah. uh, not only young people, but any other, you know, maybe even constituents who are listening in today about how to, uh, and, and you mentioned Philippians 2 earlier, right. emptying ourselves and giving up yeah. our Amen. rights. How, how do we I mean, put, put hands and feet on that? <laughs> well, I, I think part of the pragmatics is, is what I try to say in the book is, is taking our cues from those alien, stranger, marginalized Christians, historically and even now. So in other words, let's see how they're doing it. Let's see how they're navigating not having power and privilege and resource. Let's figure out what does it mean? How have they been able to hang on tenaciously to Jesus yet not have this clout in society? Because that's actually what's gonna be required of us as a church. So I would want to say that the practical part of that is is if there's a way we can be, um, I don't know, maybe change the priorities of what we're listening to and what we're engaging to say that our priorities have to get, get, get reshaped in terms of uh, this community of Jesus and the one another's of the Bible, the, the non-hierarchical way that the church could be operating, the neither Jew nor Greek male nor female slave or free kind of way that Paul is talking. If we could start to figure out how to practice that in our communities better, I think that that's like a first order of business and, and, and retrieving and even claiming and owning this marginalized status and not being ashamed of it. I think that that would be better. I think that's a good start for us. And I, I don't know practically what that's going to mean for each congregation, but I think it does mean a, a reassessment to say, can we be, can we can we, we know people are going to be voting different ways, but let's, can we make that less significant than you living out as a, a, a follower or, or, or a member of the kingdom of God? You know? what, I, what I'm hearing you say mm -hmm. is that our, our churches and communities ought to be focusing uh, in first order on unity mm -hmm. and our politics derive from that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's well said. Focusing on unity, and that unity is can be hard. It can be costly, because I'm also saying that in, when the church is working on that, we still have our own issues with power and privilege that, that we're seeing in Corinthians and in all these other communities. So, but if we can negotiate that and navigate that, I think that gives us a better way of operating in the world as a whole. So, yeah, I think you captured what I'm trying to say. In, in my experience, uh, pastors and church leaders either are too afraid to talk about politics or talk about politics too much. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, as a former pastor yourself, yeah. what advice would you, you give know, to pastors uh, to I, navigate that? Yeah, I'll do my best, cause, but we're in some tricky times because it's, I mean, something as well, I, what I think would be innocuous is wearing a mask becomes politicized. You know, if I say that Black Lives Matter, people get really mad. So we're in a funny place right now. So I don't, it's almost like everything is interpreted politically. So it's kind of hard to answer the question in a way. But, but I do think that what I tried to do was point to what I considered the way of, of justice and, and mercy when I'm reading scripture and teaching scripture, say so like the Sermon on the Mount or other passages. And I would hope that, okay, sometimes people don't get it. If you make a subtle reference, they're not getting it. So I realized part of my problem was I was subtle. And, uh, and sometimes people didn't get the subtlety. They want you to name the person, you know, or name the president or name the thing. And sometimes that works because it's explicit. It's right there in our faces. But there's other times I don't need to name whether it's, you know, it's like the book of Revelation. You know, nobody says Ciro, uh, Nero. Nobody is saying, you know, uh, Domitian, if that's the guy. We, we, but everybody knows, you know, what, what, who Babylon is. And uh, so there's a way, I think, of, of making reference to the power without trying to shame or any particular person. But uh, so I, I don't tell people how to vote. But I do think that there are some things that we need to be paying attention to that um, will impact how, how legislation uh, gets made. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's a, you raise an interesting point because mm -hmm. it, it comes back to when you say there's, there's a great deal that the audience is responsible for. Yes. Like in those moments, I've always found it fascinating. It, this happened to me. I, I preached um, this probably a year or so ago. 
and spoke just briefly to the general political scene, named no names, but someone came up to me afterwards and said, oh, I know you were talking about so-and-so. <laughs> and I said, I didn't say that. And right. I said, it might be worth exploring how you knew that's who I was referencing. Yeah, like they filled that in, which is a, a fascinating point. thing. That's a good point. Yeah. I, but you're also speaking to something you touch on a couple times in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe it's in uh, the passage about spirit and, and also about, the, about anger and worship. But it's also, it's, it's taking a stand against the powers. You know, we're not wanting to focus so much on flesh and blood, but we don't right. realize right. a pervasive darkness and Thank evil. You. Thank you. What does it look like for us to stand against the yeah. powers for, yeah. for spiritual battle in wow. the midst of this? Oh, my. Th thank you. Right. That, that's a great question. And I, you know, even as you guys are asking questions, I'm now, like, recalling the chapters of the book that I, you know, wrote it because I, I wasn't, didn't know exactly what the questions were going to be, but you're refreshing my memory on some things that that passage, right, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood that Paul is saying in Ephesians, to me that's so key for our time because I really think the devil is playing us in many ways, plays us against each other, There's a, and then we start to think our, our enemies are human, and so we get mad at each other, cancel each other. I mean, that to me is playing right into the devil's schemes, that if we could recognize that there are spiritual forces at work that are always at work to divide us, to, to hurt us, as Peter would say, the devil's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I mean, he's on the prey, prowling. I think if we could understand that, then the practical part would be we'd be a much more um, uh, focused on prayer in our churches than I think we are. We wouldn't just give it lip service. We would actually be wrestling in prayer, I think. I think the other thing is that we'd be trying so hard to live counter to that, knowing that those powers that are at work, that we would want to, as Paul says, put on the armor of God. We would be so attentive to, now I don't mean to hyper-spiritualize to the point where it's just like, you know, we retreat from the rest of the world and we do our memory verses and we get in our comfortable enclaves. No, I'm saying we get, we fit ourselves for this battle so that we can go to work every day and deal with, with what's going on in the world, but we go with the community of believers with us, with our prayers, with this sense that God's with us in the world. So the pragmatics, I think, are, do relate to prayer, to Scripture, to some of those basic things. But even as I say that, I get a little nervous that people will hear it as church as usual. And uh, what I mean is there's, there's a rev there can be a revived interest in embracing the power of the Spirit. Yeah. Hmm. In, in thinking about the powers, uh, principalities yeah. and powers yeah. in the New Testament, uh, one of the questions we got was about critical race theory yeah. and uh, yeah. speak to systemic justice. So Brian could read that question hmm. real quick, and then if we could hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, it really came in, in a couple of different forms. Um, but I'll go with this one, a little bit more explanation behind it. Many people who address racial injustices do so through the lens of critical race theory. Um, given your presentation about Christ's example being seen in the way marginalized people conduct themselves, how should Christians relate or respond to that theory and their approach to injustice? Yeah, well, I mean, with anything, and I think I'd say this anything from science to sociology to all kinds of things, there, there are ways of approaching and getting at the same beast, if you will, kind of conquering it with different tools at our disposal. And as Christians, we then funnel everything through the spirit and through our understanding of scripture as best we can. So I'm not intimidated by anything. I mean, I just think, uh, at least I try not to be. Um, I, I think about how, you know, we as biblical scholars got trained with historical critical methodologies, and we take some of that to help us, although some people use crit historical critical methodologies to throw out some parts of the Bible. So I think what happens is we, we take from those tools questions and processes and ways of thinking that can help us to shed a light on, on the Bible, even though I might not embrace everything, right? So I think what critical race theory has done is help us to see an intersection of things, to see how power works in society, how power works in, in racial dynamics. And, uh, and I'm, I mean, I don't have to be an expert on it to say we've gleaned some things about how, to, how people and systems work. That's fine with me. What I have found is that Christians get a little nervous when, when something is introduced to them that they didn't know about before 
it didn't come from a verse in the Bible, so consequently they're going to dismiss it all. But they don't think that way when they step on the gas pedal in their car and they have no idea how combustion engines work, but they'll, but they'll drive the car and put the gasoline in it. So they're not questioning whether gasoline is a holy thing or not. I mean, it, it's, but, but when it comes to other aspects of things that they don't understand, they get very suspect. And I think really the suspicion comes because they might have to change the way they behave. I mean, I just think it's fundamentally that. So I'm saying critical race theory has given us a lens, one lens, not the only lens, but one lens on how to look at power in our society and how it relates to race. And some of that is actually very helpful to see how, how um, secular uh, communities operate. And now here's the test for the Christians. You know, instead of rejecting critical race theory, maybe you could ask yourselves, how is power working in my church? How is privilege working in my church? So rather than questioning the system, let's go back to the Bible and say critical race theory maybe has given us a, the language of power. How might that be working out in our, in our place? <clears throat> and on that point, if I can mm -hmm. just commend you yeah. with this book, yeah. I thought this uh, was a redemptive moment hmm. for critical race theory. And that's hmm. when students bring this up to me, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and I, I think we're, we're yeah. saying the same thing. How do okay. we redeem this? Right, right. Okay. for use in the church yeah, or yeah. in society, in our communities. And I, I really thought your book was really well, helpful because it places power where God places power. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That, that, well, that's well said. That's what I was trying to do. So Appreciate thank you. That. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. On this point, I, mm -hmm. I do want to ask, um, most of your life has been spent in major urban centers. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, Illinois is not that. <laughs> um, and, and many of our students don't come from Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis, other places. Mm -hmm. um, who are the people on the margins in rural communities mm -hmm. uh, so that we can help, help our, our people see them? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate the question, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to cop out, but I'm going to turn it back. Because to ask me who are those folks means that I should know this context, right? And I don't. Like you said, I'm a, I'm a city guy. So I put the ball in your court, okay. is to do a little homework and say, who are those people that I'm not seeing, right? Now, in some cases, it's, it might be obvious. It's like this morning at the hotel, I was sitting and having a little breakfast, and there weren't that many people there. And I was one of the last ones, or at least by myself for a while, and I was hearing the people working, who were working there talking about, um, things that they didn't like, like I had to clean this up and I had to do this and, and I couldn't find the, uh, the creamers and things. And they were having this conversation about their work. And I thought, you know, that's, to me, those, those are folks that can easily be overlooked, right? The people who are providing me a service, but all I want is the service, right? So I'm not seeing the people who are providing it. I don't know who that is here. I don't know if there's people doing, you know, who are um, harvesting crops. I don't know if it's people working in factory. I don't really know. But what I am saying is that there's always a power dynamic. And it might, and we might oversimplify at times for convenience, I do it, to talk black and white because I am African American. But I know there's power dynamics between men and women. I know there's power dynamics between new immigrants and people who've been here longer. So I think that the ball is in the court for, for you folks here to say, what's happening in Lincoln? Maybe that's like an assignment I'll give myself or people in my church that think, who is it that we might be overlooking, you know, and think, what does the church have to say to our relationship across those lines? Yeah. That's very helpful. Uh, what advice then would you give us in developing eyes to see, mm. as it were? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, Frank. Okay. <laughs> you kind of put it, put it back to me in a way. I, I think, well, I'll just say what shaped me, you know, what shaped me was earlier on in ministry, I didn't think about the role of women in ministry, although I was, there was nothing inside of me that thought that women shouldn't be able to exercise gifts in church, however that looks. And I know churches have different views on this, but, but I didn't know, I mean, it was nothing inside me. It had to be taught to me that women can't do something. And, and it, I just thought, okay, I guess, but that was the way people were saying it. And then I got to a place where I thought, well, let, let, me, let me consider this biblically and in other ways. And my eyes had to be opened, right? So it's like, you know, Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. I had to be born again in a way. You know, I had to experience some, a birth from above to have my eyes open to something. So I think part of the tools are um, when, you, when you 
pay attention to the stories of people who are, who have been marginalized, you start to become more and more acquainted with their world. So stories are important, right? And uh, I mentioned this book, Cast, by Isabel Wilkinson. I'm, well, I mentioned her Warmth of Other Sons earlier. I'm going to mention the book this afternoon. But she has a book on Cast. And, and then it kind of came together for me because I was listening to news this morning about um, uh, Indian immigrants, immigrants from India who work in Silicon Valley, and how there's caste dis um, distinctions there that they brought with them here. And we didn't even know it. So what we used to call undercaste, the Dalits, they're getting pushed to the side by people who are in the Brahmin caste that Americans have no clue about, right? But as I'm listening to this guy, I'm saying, oh, because I read her book, I'm aware that that's a thing, right? And now it's important for me to listen to him. Like, how has he been pushed to the side in a place where we might, we might just say, well, they're all Indians, right? And um, so I guess part of the thing is my eyes get open when I'm listening to the stories and I'm reading and I'm paying attention to folks who are telling me how they've experienced. So it's something I say in the book about standpoint theory. When there's a system that, of injustice, the folks who are on the bottom actually have a better view of that injustice than the folks on the top. So I need to train my, my ears and eyes to, to listen to them. Where, where do we go to uh, hear those stories? Yeah, some is in books, right? So you're going to read books by people who, who don't represent what we're used to. So uh, it's not a knock on white men. It's just that that's who's had the power to uh, produce in our society. So read books by women, read books by ethnic minorities. So part of it is the reading. And then I think part of it is now that we have, you know, I mean, my goodness, social media and access to the world through the internet, you have the opportunity to hear the stories of people uh, who've been in different situations. When I was in Minnesota for a pastor for six years, I didn't know as much about the Native American community than I learned when I was in Minnesota. So this whole notion even today, I mean yesterday being Indigenous Peoples Day, was like a big deal that I, as a New York kid, I didn't know as much about, and even though of course Native Americans got pushed aside there too. But I learned more in Minnesota because of the strength of that community there. So where do I go? I go, I, I, I go to the library, I go to the internet, and I go to my friends. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, let me jump in there. Uh, just for the sake, there's a, there's a lot of folks, I, I would suspect in a moment, Frank will probably ask a question um, regarding you, you're pointing us in the direction of um, theologians that mm -hmm. have have written and scholars who have written yeah. sometimes from the margins. Yeah. Uh, but you also touched on books just now um, that might rest outside of the typical mm. uh, biblical theological yeah, stream. That's true. But I am curious. I, I one of the questions that has always been I mean, an interesting one for me, and I think es especially for this generation that is multimedia. And, and really fascinated by art. I, I'm curious, um, have there been works of fiction that have given you the eyes to see or can give us the eyes to see? Are there, uh, you, you mentioned, and I appreciate it in the books, works of fiction, cinematic uh, movies, television shows. Yeah. Are there things we can read in the world of fiction, things we can mm. watch that will shape us, that will give voice to these stories we haven't heard? Wow. Uh, well, the answer is yes. The, 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 the question is, which ones, Dennis? And uh, so that, that's going to be harder. And I'm also at a Christian university, so I'm careful here um, because some things people will have to wade through carefully. But I, I'm just thinking of two things I just saw on, t on uh, well, that I am aware of are on, um, <laughs> on HBO. <laughs> people are allowed to laugh. I'm being a little uh, silly in saying that, but, but the... Um, the Watchmen series, that, the mini series that was done on HBO, was heavy, but it's it's so it's in this genre that um, is like a graphic novel, right? But it really touched on uh, issues of race and power, and right now Lovecraft Country is doing that with a sci-fi genre uh, set in the 50s in Chicago, with um, you know black protagonists. Uh, there's there's something about seeing, you know, in a sci-fi or a, this graphic novel genre, the, the issues being played out about power and privilege, in this case race, that might help some people to see things that they didn't catch. Now, I mentioned those two. My, if my kids were here who are millennials, they could 
you know, quickly give an answer to that question because old man doesn't, you know, spend that much time in those genres, that, especially where I'm trying to write books now. But I, <laughs> so it's hard for me to answer, Brian, but I do know that there's a, I mean, the young folks listening to this right now will probably come up with a quicker list because they know that whether it's in music or in a uh, movie, that there are voices of people who, who are trying to say their story, trying to let us know what's happening in the world, and uh, if we would only just tune in. Yeah, so it's there, it's there. Uh, one final question, and it is okay. about resources. Mm. Uh, but we, uh, in, in this university, we come from a tradition that focuses on scripture. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, and I, I try to communicate this in my classes, particularly about the New Testament, but I think it's true of the entire Bible. It's, it is literature from below. Yeah. These yeah. are a typically oppressed people. They're not right. in power. Right. Um, and so, in a lot of ways, all of the scriptures speak to this perspective. But what I'm wondering from you yeah. is if you have a couple of texts that you continue to gravitate toward that you could give to our listeners today, uh, hmm. that they could do research, that they could reflect on and think about from these perspectives. Mm. When you say texts, you mean... Um, Passages of scripture. Oh, your, oh your, you mean your canon, texts. Yeah, your canon within oh. a canon. <laughs> oh. I'm like stumbling. I haven't been asked that before, but in some ways, I think it's kind of what I was tipping my hat with that with this book, because First Peter does that for me in terms of the, especially at chapter two, because I cringe at chapter two, slaves, you know, obey your masters, kind of stuff. But but it's but it is this empowering thing that starts to come out for me. I would say also, um, yeah, I mentioned Galatians three twenty eight before. And, and that kind of connects to me with Colossians 3. There's this, there's a place where um, um, Paul says similar language, you know, be slave and free, barbarian, Scythian, bond and free, you know, that, that kind of language, that those verses stand out to me. And then lastly is actually, uh, it's a debated kind of a book, but it's Philemon. And it's the question that is what is happening there in that book and, uh, and what's Philemon got to get right here? that Paul wants to, wants to enforce there. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that one because I think that, okay, Onesimus never speaks. He doesn't have a voice, but there's something about his situation, his devotion, his um, uh, fellowship with Paul that is, is a message for Philemon, the guy in power in this story. So there are some places like that that I go to where I think about this. And then, uh, then my mind runs to a bunch of Old Testament stories where marginal people, you know, slave women and others who have the voice, you know, like with Naaman to get his leprosy healed. It's a servant girl who says, what's the big deal of dipping in the Jordan, you know? And, uh, and he's got to get the, the push for the faith from somebody that, we, you know, we barely know and don't even know their names. But those are the people that I run to a lot to say they're the voice of God to people. Thank you, Dennis. Mm, thank uh, you. We, we are out of time, uh, and I just want to thank you again oh, for your time you. and coming here. Thank you for the book. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone who wrote in questions, and thank yeah. you to Brian thank uh, you. as well.